two tribunes, Flavius and Muralis, enter Roman street, along with various commoners, Flavius and Muralis derisively order the commoners to return home and get back to work, what, no you're not, being mechanical, you ought not to walk, upon a laboring day without the sign, of your profession, I dot I dot to A5, Muralis engages a cobbler in a lengthy inquiry about his profession misinterpreting the cobbler's punning replies, Marcellus quickly grows angry with him, Flavius interjects to ask why the cobbler is not in his shop working, the cobbler explains that he is taking a holiday from work to observe the triumph, a lavish parade celebrating military victory A he wants to watch Caesar's procession through the city, which will include the captives won in a recent battle against his arch-rival Pompey, Muralis scolds the cobbler and attempts to diminish the significance of Caesar's victory over Pompey and his consequent triumph, what conquest brings him home, slash what tributaries follow him, Caesar, to Rome, to Greece in captive bonds his chariot wheels, Marcellus asks, suggesting that Caesar's victory does not merit a triumph since it involves no conquering of a foreign foe to the greater glory of Rome, I.I.31 A 33, Muralis reminds the commoners of the days when they used to gather to watch and cheer for Pompey's triumphant returns from battle, now, however, due to a mere twist of fate, they rush out to celebrate his downfall, Muralis scolds them further for their disloyalty, ordering them to pray to the gods to intermit the plague, that needs must light on this ingratitude, I.I.53 A 54, the commoners leave, and Flavius instructs Muralis to go to the capital, a hill on which rests a temple on whose altars victorious generals offer sacrifice, and remove any crowns placed on statues of Caesar. Flavius adds that he will thin the crowds of commoners observing the triumph and directs Muralis to do likewise, for if they can regulate Caesar's popular support, they will be able to regulate his power, these growing feathers plucked from Caesar's wing, will make him fly an ordinary pitch, I.I.71 dot, I dot A 72, Caesar enters a public square with Antony, Calpurnia, Portia, Decius, Cicero, Brutus, Cassius, Casca, and a soothsayer he is followed by a throng of citizens and then by Flavius and Muralis, Antony, dressed to celebrate the feast day, readies himself for a ceremonial run through the city, Caesar urges him to touch Calpurnia, Caesar's wife, as he runs since Roman superstition holds that the touch of a ceremonial runner will cure barrenness, Antony agrees, declaring that whatever Caesar says is certain to become fact, the soothsayer calls out from the crowd to Caesar, telling him to beware of the Ides of March, the Ides refers to the 15th day of March, May, July, and October and the 13th day of the other months in the ancient Roman calendar, Caesar pauses and asks the man to come forward the soothsayer repeats himself, Caesar ultimately dismisses the warning, and the procession departs, Brutus and Cassius remain, Cassius asks Brutus why he has not seemed himself lately, Brutus replies that he has been quiet because he has been plagued with conflicting thoughts, but he assures Cassius that even though his mind is at war with itself, he will not let his inner turmoil affect his friendships, Cassius and Brutus speak together, Cassius asks Brutus if Brutus can see his face, Brutus replies that he cannot, Cassius then declares that Brutus is unable to see what everyone else does, namely, that Brutus is widely respected, noting that no mirror could reveal Brutus's worthiness to himself, Cassius offers to serve as a human mirror so that Brutus may discover himself and conceive of himself in new ways, Brutus hears shouting and says that he fears that the people want to make Caesar their king, when Cassius asks, Brutus affirms that he would rather that Caesar not assume the position, Brutus adds that he loves Caesar but that he also loves honor, and that he loves honor even more than he fears death, Cassius replies that he, too, recoils at the thought of kneeling in awe before someone whom he does not consider his superior, and declares, I was born as free as Caesar, so were you, slash we both have fed as well, and we can both, endure the winter's cold as well as he, I 299 A 101, Cassius recalls a windy day when he and Caesar stood on the banks of the Tiber River, and Caesar dared him to swim to a distant point, they raced through the water, 
but Caesar became weak and asked Cassius to save him. Cassius had to drag him from the water. Cassius also recounts an episode when Caesar had a fever in Spain and experienced the seizure. Cassius marvels to think that a man with such a feeble constitution should now stand at the head of the civilized world. Caesar stands like a colossus over the world. Cassius continues, while Cassius and Brutus creep about under his legs, he tells Brutus that they owe their underlying status not to fate but to their failure to take action. He questions the difference between the name Caesar and the name Brutus. Why should Caesar's name be more celebrated than Brutus's when, spoken together, the names sound equally pleasing and thus suggest that the men should hold equal power. He wonders in what sort of age they are living when one man can tower over the rest of the population. Brutus responds that he will consider Cassius's words, although unwilling to be further persuaded. He admits that he would rather not be a citizen of Rome in such strange times as the present. Meanwhile, Caesar and his train return. Caesar sees Cassius and comments to Antony that Cassius looks like a man who thinks too much such men are dangerous, he adds. Antony tells Caesar not to worry, but Caesar replies that he prefers to avoid Cassius. Cassius reads too much and finds no enjoyment in plays or music as such men are never at ease while someone greater than themselves holds the reins of power. Caesar urges Antony to come to his right side yeah, he is deaf in his left era and tell him what he thinks of Cassius. Shortly, Caesar and his train depart. Brutus and Cassius take Casca aside to ask him what happened at the procession. Casca relates that Antony offered a crown to Caesar three times. But Caesar refused at each time. While the crowd cheered for him, Caesar fell to the ground in a fit. Brutus speculates that Caesar has the falling sickness, a term for epilepsy in Elizabethan times. Casca notes, however, that Caesar's fit did not seem to affect his authority. Although he suffered his seizure directly before the crowd, the people did not cease to express their love. Casca adds that the great orator Cicero spoke in Greek, but that he couldn't understand him at all. Saying it was Greek to me, I too 278. He concludes by reporting that Flavius and Muralus were deprived of their positions as civil servants for removing decorations from Caesar's statues. Casca then departs, followed by Brutus. Cassius, alone now, says that while he believes that Brutus is noble, he hopes that Brutus's noble nature may yet be bent, for who so firm that cannot be seduced? He asks rhetorically. I-2306. He decides to forge letters from Roman citizens declaring their support for Brutus and their fear of Caesar's ascent to power he will throw them into Brutus's house that evening. Casca and Cicero meet on a Roman street. Casca says that though he has seen many terrible things in the natural world, nothing compares to the frightfulness of this night's weather. He wonders if there is strife in heaven or if the gods are so angered by mankind that they intend to destroy it. Casca relates that he saw a man with his hands on fire, and yet his flesh was not burning. He describes meeting a lion near the capital, bizarrely. The lion ignored him and walked on. Many others have seen men on fire walking in the streets, and an owl, a nocturnal bird, was seen sitting out in the marketplace during the day. When so many abnormal events happen at once, Casca declares, no one could believe that they are natural occurrences. Casca insists that they are portents of danger ahead. Cicero replies that men will interpret things as they will. Indeed it is a strange dispose a tilde di time. But men may construe things after their fashion, clean from the purpose of the things themselves. I-333 A-35 Cicero asks if Caesar is coming to the capital the next day Casca replies that he is. Cicero departs, warning that it is not a good atmosphere in which to remain outside. Cassius enters, he has been wandering through the streets, taking no shelter from the thunder and lightning. Casca asks Cassius why he would endanger himself so. Cassius replies that he is pleased that he believes that the gods are using these signs to warn the Romans about a monstrous state, meaning both an abnormal state of affairs and an atrocious government. I-371 Cassius compares the night to Caesar himself, who like this dreadful night, dot, thunders, lightens, opens graves, and roars as doth the lion in the capital, I-372 A-74. He almost calls Caesar prodigious groan, and fearful, 
as these strange eruptions are, I-376 A-77 Casca reports to Cassius that the senators plan to make Caesar king in the senate the following day. Cassius draws his dagger and swears to the gods that if they can make a weak man like Caesar so powerful, then they can empower Cassius to defeat the tyrant. He declares that Rome must be merely trash or rubbish to give itself up so easily to Caesar's fire. Casca joins Cassius in his censure of Caesar and Cassius reveals that he has already swayed several high-powered Romans to support a resistance movement, a conspirator named Slanters. Cassius now divulges his latest scheme and his plot to build opposition against Caesar, the conversion of Brutus. Cassius gives some of the letters he has forged to place in Brutus's chair in the Senate, and others to throw through Brutus's window and place on Brutus's statue. Cassius claims that Brutus has already come three quarters of the way toward turning against Caesar. He hopes the letters will bring him the rest of the way around. Casco comments that the noble Brutus's participation in their plot will bring worthiness to their schemes, for he sits high in all the people's hearts, and that which would appear offense in us, his countenance, like Christian's alchemy, will change to virtue and to worthiness. I-3 157-A-60 Brutus paces back and forth in his garden. He asks his servant to bring him a light and mutters to himself that Caesar will have to die. He knows with certainty that Caesar will be crowned king What he questions is whether or not Caesar will be corrupted by his power. Although he admits that he has never seen Caesar swayed by power in the past. He believes that it would be impossible for Caesar to reach such heights without eventually coming to score in those lower in status. Brutus compares Caesar to the egg of the serpent which, hatched, what does his kind grow mischievous thus? He determines to kill him in the shell, 2i.33a34. Brutus's servant enters with a letter that he has discovered near the window. Brutus reads the letter, which accuses him of sleeping while Rome is threatened. Brutus. Thou sleepest, awake, and see thyself. 2i.46 Brutus interprets the letter as a protest against Caesar, thus must I piece it out. Shall Rome stand under one man's awe? 2i.51a52 Believing the people of Rome are telling him their desires through this single letter, he resolves to take the letter's challenge to speak, strike, redress. 2i.47 and knock comes at the door. Brutus's servant announces Cassius and a group of Mina the conspirators. They include Casca, Decius, Cinna, Metellus, and Tribonius. Cassius introduces the men, then draws Brutus aside. The two speak briefly before rejoining the others. Cassius suggests that they swear an oath, but Brutus demurs. They do not need oaths, he says since their cause should be strong enough to bind them together. The group discusses whether it should try to bring the esteemed Cicero into the conspiracy, for he would bring good public opinion to their schemes. But Brutus dissuades them, pointing out that Cicero would never follow anyone else's ideas. Cassius then suggests that they would do well to kill Antony in addition to Caesar, but Brutus refuses, saying that this would make their plan too bloody. According to Brutus, they only stand against the spirit of Caesar, which he wishes could be destroyed without the necessity of killing the man himself. He says that they should kill him boldly, but not viciously so that they might be perceived as purging the state rather than as murderers. Cassius replies that he still fears Antony, but Brutus assures him that Antony will be rendered harmless once Caesar is dead. Cassius states that no one knows whether Caesar will come to the capital that day since the warnings of augurs. Sirs or soothsayers, after this brutal evening might keep him at home. But Decius assures the others that he will be able to convince Caesar to ignore his superstitions by flattering his bravery. The conspirators depart, Brutus suggesting that they try to behave like actors and hide their true feelings and intentions. Brutus's wife, Portia, enters the garden. She wonders what has been worrying Brutus for his behavior has been strange. He says that he has felt unwell. She asks why he refuses to tell her his concerns, insisting that, as his wife, she should be told about his problems and assuring him that she will keep his secrets. Brutus replies that he wishes he were worthy of such an honorable wife. They hear a knock at the door, and Brutus sends her away with a promise to talk to her later. Ligarius enters looking sick. He says he would not be sick if he could be sure that Brutus was involved in a scheme in the name of Anner. Brutus says that he is. Ligarius rejoices and accompanies Brutus offstage to hear more of the plan. C. 
Caesar wanders through his house in his dressing gown, kept awake by his wife Calpurnia's nightmares. Three times she has called out in her sleep about Caesar's murder. He sends a servant to bid the priests offer a sacrifice and tell him the results. Calpurnia enters and insists that Caesar not leave the house after so many ominous signs. Caesar rebuffs her, refusing to give in to fear. But Calpurnia, who has never heeded omens before, speaks of what happened in the city earlier that night. Dead men walked, ghosts wander the town, a lioness gave birth in the street and lightning shattered the skies. These signs portend true danger, she says Caesar cannot afford to ignore them. Caesar counters that nothing can change the plans of the gods. He deems the signs to apply to the world in general and refuses to believe that they bode ill for him. Calpurnia says that the heavens proclaim the death of only great men, so the omens must have to do with him. Caesar replies that while cowards imagine their death frequently, thus dying in their mind several times over, Brave men, refusing to dwell on death, die only once. He cannot understand why men fear death, which must come eventually to all. The servant enters, reporting that the augurs recommend that Caesar stay home. They examined the entrails of an animal and were unable to find a heart a, a bad sign. But Caesar maintains that he will not stay home out of fear. Danger cannot affect Caesar. He says, Calpurnia begs him to send Antony to the Senate in his place finally, Caesar relents. Decius enters, saying that he has come to bring Caesar to the Senate. Caesar tells him to tell the senators that he will be absent that day. Calpurnia tells him to plead illness, but Caesar refuses to lie. Decius then asks what reason he should offer. Caesar states that it is simply his will to stay home. He adds that Calpurnia has had a dream in which she saw his statue run with blood like a fountain, while many smiling Romans bathed their hands in the blood she has taken this to portend danger for Caesar. Decius disputes Calpurnia's interpretation, saying that actually, the dream signifies that Romans will all gain lifeblood from the strength of Caesar. He confides that the Senate has decided to give Caesar the crown that day if Caesar were to stay at home, the senators might change their minds. Moreover, Caesar would lose public regard if he were perceived as so easily swayed by woman, or by fear. Caesar replies that his fears now indeed seem small. He calls for his robe and prepares to depart. Cassius and Brutus enter with Ligarius, Metellus, Casca, Tribonius, and Cinna to escort him to the Senate. Finally, Antony enters. Caesar prepares to depart. Artmodorus comes on stage, reading to himself a letter that he has written Caesar, warning him to be wary of Brutus, Casca, and the other conspirators. He stands along the route that Caesar will take to the Senate, prepared to hand a letter to him as he passes. He is sad to think that the virtue embodied by Caesar may be destroyed by the ambitious envy of the conspirators. He remains hopeful. However, that if his letter gets read, Caesar may yet live. Portia sends Brutus's servant to the Senate to observe events and report back to her how Caesar is faring. A soothsayer enters, and Portia asks him if Caesar has gone to the Capitol yet. The soothsayer replies that he knows that Caesar has not yet gone. He intends to wait for Caesar along his route since he wants to say a word to him. He goes to the street to wait. Helping Caesar's entourage will let him speak to the great man. Artmodorus and the soothsayer await Caesar in the street. Caesar enters with Brutus, Cassius, Casca, Decius, Metellus, Tribonius, Cinna, Ligarius, Antony, and other senators. Artmodorus approaches with his letter, saying that its contents are a matter of closest concern for Caesar. Caesar responds, What touches us on ourself shall be last servita that is, his concerns are his last priority. 3i.8 Artmodorus tells him to read it instantly, but Caesar dismisses him as crazy. The group enters the Senate, and Cassius worries that the assassination plot has been discovered. Tribonius draws Antony away from the Senate room. Metellus approaches Caesar to request that his brother, Publius Cimber, who has been banished from Rome, be granted permission to return. Caesar answers that since Publius was banished by lawful decree, there is no just cause for absolving his guilt. Brutus and Cassius kneel at Caesar's feet and repeat me. Tellus's plea Caesar answers that he will not change his mind now, declaring himself as constant as the Northern Star, 3i.60. When Cinna comes forward and kneels to plead further, Caesar adds another comparison, 
suggesting that they might as well help to lift Olympus, the mountain where the gods were believed to dwell, as to sway Caesar and his convictions. 3i.74 Decius and Ligarius, followed by Casca, come forward to kneel at Caesar's feet. Casca stabs Caesar first, and the others quickly follow, ending with Brutus. Recognizing that Brutus, too, has joined with the conspirators, Caesar speaks his last words, at 2, Brute? A then fall Caesar, 3i.76. He then yields and dies. The conspirators proclaim the triumph of liberty and many exits in tumult, including Lapidus and Artmidorus. Tribonius enters to announce that Antony has fled. Brutus tells the conspirators that they have acted as friends to Caesar by shortening the time that he would have spent fearing death. He urges them to bend down and bathe their hands in Caesar's blood, then walk to the marketplace, the Roman Forum, with their bloodied swords to proclaim peace, freedom, and liberty. Cassius agrees declaring that the scene they now enact will be repeated time and again in the ages to come as a commemorative ritual. Antony's servant enters with a message, Antony, having learned of Caesar's death, sends word that he loved Caesar but will now vote to serve Brutus if Brutus promises not to punish him for his past allegiance. Brutus says that he will not harm Antony and sends the servant to bid him to come. Brutus remarks to Cassius that Antony will surely be an ally now. But Cassius replies that he still has misgivings. Antony enters and sees Caesar's corpse. He marvels how a man so great indeed in reputation could end as such a small and pathetic body. He tells the conspirators that if they mean to kill him as well, they should do it at once, for there would be no better place to die than beside Caesar. Brutus tells Antony not to beg for death, saying that although their hands appear bloody, their hearts have been, and continue to be, Full of pity although they must appear to him now as having acted in cruelty, their actual motives stem from sympathy and love for the Roman populace. Brutus tells Antony to wait until the conspirators have calmed the multitude then they will explain fully why they have killed Caesar. Antony says he does not doubt their wisdom and shakes each of their bloody hands, staining the not yet bloodied hands of Tribonius, who has returned from leading Antony astray. In the process, Antony now addresses Caesar's departed spirit, asking to be pardoned for making peace with the conspirators over his dead body. After Antony praises Caesar's bravery, Cassius questions his loyalty. Antony assures Cassius that he indeed desires to be numbered among their friends, explaining that he merely forgot himself for a moment upon seeing Caesar's body. He emphasizes that he will gladly ally himself with all of the former conspirators as long as they can explain to him why Caesar was dangerous. Brutus assures Antony that he will find their explanation satisfactory. Antony asks if he might bring the body to the forum and speak a funeral oration. Brutus consents, but Cassius urges him against granting permission. He tells Brutus that Antony will surely move the people against them if he is allowed to speak. Brutus replies that he will preface Antony's words, explaining to the public the reason for the conspirator's deed and then explained that Antony has been allowed to speak only by Brutus's consent. He believes that the people will admire his magnanimity for allowing Antony, a friend of Caesar's, to take part in this funeral and that the episode will benefit the conspiracy's public image. Cassius remains displeased, but Brutus allows Antony to take Caesar's body instructing him to speak well of them since they are doing him a favor by permitting him to give the oration. All depart Antony remains alone on stage. He asks Caesar to pardon him for being gentle with his murderers. Antony prophesies that civil strife will follow Caesar's death and lead to much destruction. As long as the foul deed of Caesar's death remains unavenged, he predicts, Caesar's spirit will continue to seek revenge bringing chaos to Rome. Octavius's servant enters and sees the body on the ground. Antony tells him to return to Octavius, who had been traveling to Rome at Caesar's behest, and keep his master out of the city. Rome is now dangerous for Octavius, Caesar's adopted son and appointed successor. But Antony urges the servant to come to the forum and hear his funeral speech. Once they see how the public responds to the conspirators' evil deeds, they can decide how Octavius should proceed. Brutus and Cassius enter the forum with a crowd of plebeians. Cassius exits to speak to another portion of the crowd. Brutus addresses the onstage crowd, 
assuring them that they may trust in his honor. He did not kill Caesar out of a lack of love for him, he says, but because his love for Rome outweighed his love of a single man. He insists that Caesar was great but ambitious, it was for this reason that he slew him. He feared that the Romans would live as slaves under Caesar's leadership. He asks if any disagree with him, and none do. He thus concludes that he has offended no one and asserts that now Caesar's death has been accounted for, with both his virtues and faults in life given due attention. Antony then enters with Caesar's body. Brutus explains to the crowd that Antony had no part in the conspiracy but that he will now be part of the new commonwealth. The plebeians cheer Brutus's apparent kindness, declaring that Brutus should be Caesar. He quiets them and asks them to listen to Antony, who has obtained permission to give a funeral oration. Brutus exits. Antony ascends to the pulpit while the plebeians discuss what they have heard. They now believe that Caesar was a tyrant and that Brutus did right to kill him. But they wait to hear Antony. He asks the audience to listen, for he has come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. He acknowledges Brutus's charge that Caesar was ambitious and maintains that Brutus is an honorable man, but he says that Caesar was his friend. 3 to 84. He adds that Caesar brought to Rome many captives, whose countrymen had to pay their ransoms thus filling Rome's coffers. He asks rhetorically if the such accumulation of money for the people constituted ambition. Antony continues that Caesar sympathized with the poor, when that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. 3 to 88. He reminds the plebeians of the day when he offered the crown to Caesar three times, and Caesar three times refused. Again, he ponders aloud whether this humility constituted ambition. He claims that he is not trying to disprove Brutus's words but rather to tell them what he, Antony, knows he insists that as they all loved Caesar once, they should mourn for him now. Antony pauses to weep. The plebeians are touched they remember when Caesar refused the crown and wonder if more ambitious people have not stepped into his place. Antony speaks again, saying that he would gladly stir them to mutiny and rebellion. Though he will not harm Brutus or Cassius, for the area again of honorable men. He then brings out Caesar's will. The plebeians beg him to read it. Antony says that he should not, for then they would be touched by Caesar's love for them. They implore him to read it. He replies that he has been speaking too long. He wrongs the honorable men who have let him address the crowd. The plebeians call the conspirators traitors and demand that Antony read the will. Finally, Antony descends from the pulpit and prepares to read the letter to the people as they stand in a circle around Caesar's corpse, looking at the body. Antony points out the wounds that Brutus and Cassius inflicted, reminding the crowd how Caesar loved Brutus, yet Brutus stabbed him viciously. He tells how Caesar died and blood ran down the steps of the Senate. Then he uncovers the body for all to see. The plebeians weep and become enraged. Antony says that they should not be stirred to mutiny against such honorable men. 3 to 148. He protests that he does not intend to steal away their hearts, for he is no orator like Brutus. He proclaims himself a plain man. He speaks only what he knows. He says that he will let Caesar's wounds speak the rest. If he were Brutus, he claims he could urge them to rebel. But he is merely Antony. The people declare that they will mutiny nonetheless. Antony calls to them to let him finish. He has not yet read the will. He now reads that Caesar has bequeathed a sum of money from his holdings to every man in Rome. The citizens are struck by this act of generosity and swear to avenge this selfless man's death. Antony continues reading, revealing Caesar's plans to make his private parks and gardens available for the people's pleasure. The plebeians can take no more they charge off to wreak havoc throughout the city. Antony, alone. Wonders what will come of the mischief he has set loose on Rome. Octavius's servant enters. He reports that Octavius has arrived at Caesar's house, and also that Brutus and Cassius have been driven from Rome. Sin the poet, a different man from Sin the conspirator, walks through the city. A crowd of plebeians descends, asking his name. He answers that his name is Sin, and the plebeians confuse him with the conspirator Sin. Despite Sin's insistence that they have the wrong man, the plebeians drag him off and beat him to death. Antony meets Octavius and Lepidus at his house. They review a list of names, deciding who must be killed. Lepidus agrees to the death of his brother if Antony will agree to allow his nephew to be killed. Antony suggests that, as a way of saving money, 
They examine Caesar's will to see if they can redirect some of his funds. Lepidus departs, and Antony asks Octavius if Lepidus is a worthy enough man to rule Rome with him and Octavius. Octavius replies that he trusts him, but Antony harbors doubts. Octavius points out that Lepidus is a tried and valiant soldier, to which Antony responds, so is my horse. He goes on to compare Lepidus to a mere animal, calling him a barren spirited fellow and a mere tool. 4i.28 a 36. Antony now turns the conversation to Brutus and Cassius, who are reportedly gathering an army that falls to Octavius and Antony to confront them and halt their bid for power.